Szanowni Państwo, jest takie powiedzenie, wszystkim zapewne znane, myślenie ma przyszłość. Ja bym to stwierdzenie troszeczkę zmodyfikował. Powiedziałbym mianowicie, myślenie kreuje przyszłość, myślenie kreowało zawsze przyszłość. Jeżeli popatrzymy na to, co na temat powstania i rozwoju człowieka mówią różne nauki szczegółowe, to widzimy, że wszystkie te nauki podkreślają, że wyjście człowieka ze świata tylko zwierzęcego było związane oczywiście z rozwojem ludzkich możliwości kognitywnych, poznawczych, tych wszystkich, dla których podstawą jest właśnie mózg. Gdy patrzymy na późniejszy rozwój nauki i techniki, to jest rzeczą powszechnie znaną, jest faktem powszechnie akceptowanym, że ten bujny rozwój, z którego benefitów tak mocno korzystamy, nie byłby możliwy bez tych możliwości, które mamy, które posiadamy właśnie dzięki, dzięki myśleniu. Zatem z jednej strony powstaliśmy dzięki myśleniu, wyłoniliśmy się ze świata zwierzęcego dzięki myśleniu, a z drugiej strony ta nasza pozycja specyficzna w świecie jest właśnie budowana na tych wszystkich kompetencjach, umiejętnościach, zdolnościach, które bez myślenia nie byłyby możliwe. Gdy patrzymy na sytuację współczesną, to widzimy, że myślenie jest przedmiotem, który badają różne nowoczesne, niedawno powstałe nauki, różne nowoczesne, niedawno wyłonione perspektywy poznawcze. W filozofii natura myślenia była już kwestią od dawna analizowaną. Dzisiaj oczywiście trudno byłoby sobie wyobrazić sytuacji, że tylko filozofia tą kwestią się zajmuje. Dobrze, że jest wiele nowych dyscyplin, które oferują nowe podejście, które oferują nowe możliwości i które zapewniają nowe sukcesy poznawcze w tym obszarze. W kontekście tego, co powiedziałem, jest zrozumiałe, że z pełnym przekonaniem i z wielką radością mogę Państwa zaprosić na wydarzenie, które niedługo odbędzie się na naszym wydziale. Tym wydarzeniem jest Tydzień Mózgu. Druga edycja tego wydarzenia jest ponownie współorganizowana przez studentów z naszego wydziału, dokładnie mówiąc przez studentów z Koła Naukowego Kognitywistyki. Zachęcam Państwa do udziału w tym wydarzeniu tym bardziej, że również w tym roku jest to wydarzenie o charakterze międzynarodowym. Zarówno prelegenci, jak i uczestnicy, którzy zaanonsowali swój udział w tym wydarzeniu, Pochodzą nie tylko z Polski, ale także z innych krajów, z innych regionów Europy i, i świata. Pozostaje mi zatem liczyć na to, że znajdziecie Państwo czas, żeby uczestniczyć w tym wydarzeniu, żeby poszerzyć, powiększyć swoją wiedzę na temat myślenia, jak i na temat mózgu, bez którego myślenie nie byłoby przecież możliwe.
Witam Was serdecznie rok po naszym ostatnim spotkaniu. Nasi drodzy przyjaciele, w imieniu studentów naszego Uniwersytetu, studentów z Koła Naukowego Neurobiologów, studentów Koła Psychologicznego ABSC oraz studentów Koła Kognitywistyki, mam znowu ogromną przyjemność Was zaprosić na Tydzień Mózgu. Rozpocznie się w najbliższy poniedziałek, 14 marca, potrwa do 20 marca. Jak już pewnie wiecie, jest to międzynarodowe wydarzenie, podczas którego możecie poznać tajniki naszego najbardziej fascynującego organu, czyli właśnie mózgu. Podczas tego tygodnia każdy z Was, niezależnie od wieku, będzie mógł wysłuchać bardzo interesujące wykłady naukowców zajmujących się neurologią, neurobiologią z kraju i z zagranicy. Każdy z Was będzie mógł uczestniczyć w zdalnych warsztatach i wziąć udział w konkursach, tak jak zwykle z nagrodami. W imieniu naszych studentów i naszych pracowników bardzo serdecznie Was zapraszam. Witamy na Tygodniu Mózgu Maria Myśli na UMCS. Naszym pierwszym prelegentem dzisiaj jest profesor Francesco Batalia. Profesor Francesco Batalia kieruje zespołem zajmującym się badaniami nad neuronowymi sieciami pamięci na Wydziale Nauk, Matematyki i Informatyki Uniwersytetu Radboud. Pracuje jako główny badacz w Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior. Jego badania koncentrują się na pamięci i wpływie snu na mózg. Profesor Francesco Batalia otrzymał grant ELC Advanced Grant w wysokości 2,5 miliona euro w 2019 roku 
nad badania nad pamięcią uniwersalną. Pracuję nad teorią dotyczącą sieci trybu standardowego w naszym mózgu, która jest kluczowa dla naszej pamięci. W ramach konsorcjów Enlightenment i Neuroseeker finansowanych przez Unię Europejską wraz z zespołem opracowuje narzędzia nowej generacji do nagrywania zespołów neuronowych na dużą skalę oraz do połączonej zamkniętej pętli optogenetycznej stymulacji obwodów neuronowych. Profesor Batalia przedstawi wykład zatytułowany Oscillations Neural Codes – How our brain areas talking to one another. Zapraszamy do zadawania pytań, na które profesor Batalia odpowie po wykładzie. Życzymy miłego słuchania. Welcome to the Brain Week Maria Thinking at UMCS. Our first lecturer today is Professor Francesco Batalia. Professor Francesco Batalia leads the research team on neuronal networks of memory at the Faculty of Science, Mathematics and Computer Science at Radboud University. He works as a researcher and principal investigator at the Donders Institute for Brain, Cognition and Behavior. His research focuses on memory and the impact of sleep on the brain. Professor Francesca Battaglia received an ERC advance grant of two and a half million euro in 2019 for research into a universal memory. He is working on a theory about the standard mode network in our brain that is crucial for our memory. Within the EU-funded consortia Enlightenment and Neuroseeker, he and his team is developing next generation tools for large-scale neural ensemble recording and for the combined closed-loop optogenetical stimulation of neural circuits. Professor Battaglia will give a lecture on oscillations, neural code, how our brain areas talking to one another. We invite you to ask questions, which Professor Battaglia will answer after the lecture. Enjoy listening. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your invitation. And it's so nice to be together already virtually after a couple of years with a little bit less of these events as usual. So what I will uh, tell you about today is about uh, spontaneous brain dynamics uh, in a couple of different ways. So I will uh, very briefly talk about two studies that are uh, ongoing in our group that are uh, quite different, but also have a strong link between themselves. And I would say that the link is that in both case, cases, we look at spontaneous fluctuations in brain activity in the first case during sleep and in the second case during active behavior. So spontaneous activity and spontaneous fluctuations are very important for our uh, cognitive function. So we have from early psychology and early neuroscience, this idea of the brain, as we would say, as a feed forward system so that here comes a sensory input and there is a series of processing stage and some output, some decision, some behavior. I will say that instead there is, of course, massive evidence that much of cognition is internally and spontaneously generated. And that is what we set out to do. And so the perception of the outside world, rather than being an input, I would say it's a modifier to this internal dynamics. And the outcome of perception is determined by this internal dynamics. So. Most of my uh, research has been focused uh, between, uh, on the interaction between uh, the cerebral cortex and the hippocampus. And so let's talk a little bit about these two brain structures. So uh, the hippocampus is a primitive cortex. So it's, let's say the first one that has been evolved in the in evolution, so birds and reptiles have hippocampus-like structures. It's also layer structures, which means that neurons come in very neat layers, but there is only one cell layer in the hippocampus. Uh, and it is organized in gradients. So if you look at the 
Rhodes hippocampus, it looks more or less like a sausage. So we call the long axis of the social uh, sausage dorsoventral, and you have more axis. And you can see that along this axis, there is a continuous variation in the properties rather than a subdivision in areas. Neocortex is the newer part. I mean, from the phylogenetic evolutionary point of view of the brain, uh, it's mostly a mammalian uh, thing. It's organized in, by modules, more or less discrete. It is relatively homogeneous, even though it represents in humans the large size uh, of the brain. And it's scalable, which means that with just the upregulation of a few genes, we could move from uh, uh, the macaque to the chimp to the human brain, which is massively larger by scaling up the uh, surface of cortex. So if you are interested, as I am, in memory in particular, so both of these areas are uh, involved in memory and, in fact, so we talk about the dual memory systems hypothesis. And that comes initially from the lesion literature. So if you look at patients that are brain lesions, so, and if you see a patient with a hippocampal lesion, you will see, for example, that they cannot form new memories, but they will retain memories about the past and in particular about the remote past. A lesion in the neocortex may provoke also an amnesia, so loss of memory, but on with a very different profile. Maybe you lose the remote uh, memory, maybe you lose the memory for certain types of items and not for others, and so on. So to explain these results, so this was a very seminal paper from now 27 years ago by McClellan, McNaughton, and O'Reilly. And they, they said, well, yes, there are two boxes, essentially. There is a hippocampal boxes and there is a neocortical boxes. And when you learn a new memory that is mostly first in magazine uh, storage in the hippocampal system, then gradually it becomes transferred to the cerebral cortex. And this goes through this arrow here that is here is labeled with the C and the C stands for consolidation. So the memory consolidation process, which is uh, a big subject to study. And so to rephrase this, so we would say that the hippocampus makes a snapshot of an episode and then this ep episode gets analyzed in different sub circuits that may be part in the hippocampus and part in cortex. According to, uh, they would look at different information uh, according to different computational principles. So for example, you would have the visual aspect of an episode seen from the point of view of movement, of color, and so on. And so this need to be put together and to put them together. So you need to make a unitary memory. However, the cortex is a slow learner. And the way it can learn is because the hippocampus acts as a sort of instructor which rehearses continuously during sleep, for example, memories in what we call memory replay. And this arrangement is quite important because it might be instrumental to avoid overload of uh, memory by too much, too fast learning, which would cause catastrophic interference. So in this talk, we will talk about uh, bidirectional information between the uh, entirety or almost of the neocortex, the role of an oscillation that is the slow gamma rhythm in this exchange in the hippocampus. And then we'll shift gear, we'll talk about temporal codes in the hippocampus, and we'll see that the same oscillation plays also a key role there. So let's start from memory replay. So replay is part, maybe a big part of what our brain does while we sleep. So during sleep, we have a lot of activity. 
and essentially is the repetitions, the spontaneous repetition of patterns of activity that reflect previous experience. And that may allow memory consolidation, so the stabilization of memory, the transfer of memory to cerebral cortex um, to uh, gradually uh, arise. And this uh, consolidation happens uh, in a very precise dynamical state, which is quite different from what you see during active behavior. So you probably, many of you have heard about place uh, cells. So the cells that have a, uh, that activate when you are at a certain point uh, in an environment, for example, you can have a rat running on this track and you see that while, when the rat is here, so the red cell will activate and then here the yellow cell activate and then the green cell activate. And so if you look in time, you see this neat sequence of red, yellow, and green, right? And this happens during these oscillations that you see in the, the hippocampal dynamics that are called theta oscillations. That is this steady oscillation at about eight Hertz, which is about the largest local field potential. So the last largest electrical signal that you can see in a healthy uh, rodent brain. When you go to sleep, so the activity changes a lot and you don't get the steady oscillation anymore. You get what we call sharp wave ripples that are sudden bursts that happens at nearly random times. And during these random times, what you see is the replay, for example, of the same sequences that we see during active behavior. So you see that it's the red, yellow, green cells that activate in the same order. However, they activate on a much faster scale. Okay, so now these um, shark waves are very important because as uh, we and others showed now a long time ago, they also connect to global activity fluctuations in the neocortex. And so the idea is that shark waves may actually act as a way to transfer information to the neocortex. And how does it transfer it? Well, it's actually quite complex, right? Because the hippocampus is at the top of a hierarchy of cortical areas. So this is a very famous diagram by Fellerman and Van Essen, uh, where they all have the visual areas in the macaque. And look how many there are. And you see that the hippocampus is connected to the cortex. However, it is connected only uh, indirectly with most of the areas. Okay, so then if we need to make a global memory that actually involves many of these areas, how can you go about? Well, it turns out that there is a layer of areas in the brain that is quite connected to the hippocampus and might be the first mediator of uh, information between the hippocampus and neocortex. So this is a network that has been described uh, in the neuroimaging literature that we call the default mode network. So why is it called like that? Because it's actually the network that is deactivated when you do something active. Okay, So it's more active in the default mode when you just sit there in an idle fashion. And this default mode network involves many areas and these areas, they turn out to be important also for memory, for self-directed uh, cognition. So what you would call in a prospection, uh, imagery and so on. There is a huge literature in neuroimaging on this, uh, on this uh, network that is less on the interaction with the hippocampus. So this exists in humans. It has been described in humans. It has been described in monkeys. And it also exists in the macaque. And it has been shown from the functional point of view. It has been shown from the anatomical point of view. This is a very interesting study 
where we, by analyzing a lot of anatomical pathways and applying some machine learning uh, to it, we can actually find uh, three networks, so the authors found three networks. And you see that uh, this medial network is actually very similar to what we call the default node network. And in particular, you see that the areas around the midline, so this is half of a brain, it's a one hemisphere of a mouse brain. So this is the midline, and you see that many areas around the midline are affected, and these posterior areas. So this is very similar to the default mode network. There are other areas that are also relevant for what I'm saying, other networks, for what I'm, uh, I'm going to say later on, particularly what we call the sensory motor network. And you see that is almost complementary to the BMN. And this lateral network, which I will tell a little bit less about. So let's start by saying, and this we showed in 2009, that for example, in media prefrontal cortex, we do see memory replay and memory replay is coincident with hippocampal firing. Uh, and other areas in the default mode networks are also likely to be involved in replay in a heavy way. So, so this is fine, but then, so, how do these areas in the DMN interact? So what's the dynamics and how do they interact in the hippocampus? So to uh, answer these questions, we set up uh, a series of experiments with my PhD student, Rafael Pedrosa. So this is a preprint that has just been published last week on BioArchive. And here we did, uh, we have two data sets. So one data set is under anesthesia. So with uretin, which produces a, uh, sleep-like anesthesia state. And then we have actually natural sleep. And we do what's called voltage sensitive imaging. So which means that by adding a molecule to neurons, we can make them fluorescent and we can make the fluorescent be an index of the membrane potential, so the activity level. And this is done in two different ways. So with a chemical, so dye, and also with a genetic in the two data set. Then we have a probe that records electrical activity in the hippocampus. And in the anesthetized data set, we also record with a transparent grid of electrodes, uh, electrophysiological potentials from the cortical surface. Three different modalities in uh, brain activity. And so what, if you do that during sleep, so what you see is that the brain tends to be inactive until the point where you still, you see transient activation. So you see, for example, here, this yellow bubble here in time is a bubble of activation. And then you wait maybe a couple of seconds and here's a little bit more. And here there's a larger one after three seconds and a half and so on and so forth. So this is what you see mostly during non-REM sleep. REM sleep is very different, and I don't have the time to talk about it today. So if we make the statistics of the sizes of these events, so what you see is a peculiar type of distribution, which is approximated by a straight line if you are in a log-log scale. And you probably know that this kind of uh, shape corresponds to what is called the power law distribution. What's a power law distribution? It's a distribution where, of course, the probability of an event decreases with size of the event, but not that much. And there are still a considerable number of very large events. And in this case here, we saturate. So the largest events are events that essentially span the entire brain. Okay, so they couldn't be larger than that. So why is this interesting? Well, because uh, this power law uh, distribution is characteristic of uh, critical system. So what's a critical system? Is for, think, for example, uh, about uh, a physical system as a phase transition. So for example, water boiling, 
or a magnet losing or acquiring its magnetic properties when you heat it up or cool it down. And at this critical state, what happens is that the brain or the system becomes highly correlated. So also at very large distance. And so the, the activity in two points in the brain that are very far away may become correlated. And that is also a state that maximizes transmission of information. And in many types of literature, so for computational neuroscience to artificial intelligence, machine learning, is is highlighted how this critical state that is also called the edge of chaos state is what you want, for example, even if you want to train a deep neural net in machine learning. Okay, so we took these transients and besides doing the statistic, we also looked at its structure and we did it separately for the small ones. So the ones that have, that would be here in the distribution for the very large ones. So if you look at the small ones, and these are the two data set under anesthesia and under sleep, you see that we identify three networks and these three networks look a lot like the networks from this anatomy paper that I showed you before. So we have, we have here, the third one is essentially the default mode network. And you can see here in the corner and here, what is the, called the retrosplenial cortex lighting up uh, quite bright. And that is one hotspot for what we will talk about later. So then we have the somatomotor network. You see here in natural sleep, here under anesthesia. Then you have the lateral network. The lateral network unfortunately involves a lot of areas that we don't see with our imaging technique because they are to the back and to the bottom of the brain. Okay, so I, I can talk a little bit less about that. So these are the small transients. How about the, the bigger transient? Well, the bigger transients are a bit harder to cluster because of course they eventually invade the entire brain, all of them, but we can still classify them from uh, the point of view of where they are originated. And in our data, what we see is that transients tend to be either originated here in the retrosplenial cortex or they are in, originated in the somatosensory cortex here. So the somatosensory cortex is, by the way, the cortex that processes our tactile uh, sensory input. Okay, so let's look at the big transients then. And as I said, you have these two classes of transients and that some transients originate from the retrosplenial, and you see that they gradually invade the invade. So blue is the start of the transient, and you see that they, with time, so if you go from blue to red, uh, they invade the entire brain, and you see the opposite pattern coming uh, for patterns that start in the in the somatosensory areas and then reach then the center of the brain. So to zoom in and show you one example of a transient that is originated in retrosplenial cortex, this is a little movie. Each frame is uh, 100 milliseconds. And you see this starts here. And then you see that how the entire brain catches fire, so to speak, and then activity is gone, okay? So now, how about the hippocampus? I, I spoke a lot about uh, the interaction between hippocampus and cortex. Well, it turns out that hippocampus activity increases uh, with the retrosplenial trigger transients and a lot less with the somatosensory trigger transients. So there seems to be a differentiation between the two. Um, and we see another thing, this plot here. So here you have time on the X, different trans ones, and these are the big ones. You see time and you see frequency of oscillation. And you see that uh, actually, 
we do see sharp waves. So sharp wave related activity is mostly here. So around 150, 200 Hertz. But the hottest spot is in this area here, what around 20 to 50 Hertz, what we call slow gamma oscillations. So that was a bit of a surprise because typically people starting with our work from 2003, 2004, and Anton Sirota's work from 2000, uh, the same time, uh, think of sharp hippocampal cortical interaction. Now we have this new, uh, let's say, phenomenon. So this is just showing that you get hippocampal oscillations in that frequency range around uh, the time of the cortical transit. So you can do a slightly more advanced transient uh, analysis of what we call the pseudo-causality analysis. And that, in this case, we use something called phase slope index. And I'm not, I don't have the time to give you the mathematical details. You can email me if you're interested. And with what we find is that if you look at gamma, so retros, you see a negative value for gamma. And the negative value means that the slow gamma uh, tends to follow the transients. Whereas where you look for actually see a positive value, which means that uh, sharp waves precede cortical transients as a tendency. And this is true in the two, in the two data sets. So what we characterize then is a bidirectional interaction where transients that start with retrosplenial uh, will also affect the hippocampus. And the activity from the hippocampus is then spreading to the rest of the brain and also to the somatosensory network. Okay. So two different oscillations in the hippocampus that are involved in the two directions of communication. Okay, so, um, so this is the first part of the talk. And now I wanna zoom in on the hippocampus itself and look at what slow gamma does there because that will allow us to connect the dots a little bit. So, uh, Let's skip some animation here. So what I'm interested here mostly, and here I'm summarizing a lot of the li literature in the hippocampus, is what happens in this part of the hippocampus, it's called CA1. So CA1 is sort of the output structure of the hippocampus, and it, is at the com it sits at the convergence of two inputs. So one comes from another part of the hippocampus that is called CA3. And CA3 is the real memory module of the hippocampus. And the other comes from the neocortex, from what is called the entorhinal cortex. And that goes through what is called, uh, and that go goes through another projection called the, the perforant path. So CA1 neurons are sort of the uh, switchboard that switch between these two different inputs. Now, what is interesting, so what has been shown in many papers, is that slow gamma oscillations are mostly related to the communication between CA1 and CA3, so the memory module, and medium gamma, so oscillations that are a little faster, so say from 60 to 90, 100 hertz. So this oscillation actually are related to the uh, new inputs coming about new uh, information about the external world coming from the uh, from the neocortex, from the cerebral cortex. Okay, and if you look in time, you will see the amplitudes of the slow and medium gamma two fluctuates, and at some points slow gamma will win, at some some points medium gamma will win. So to analyze these processes. So my student, Matteo Guardamagna, uh, 
uh, develop this micro drive for the mass. So you see this funny hat. And in the funny hat, there are these electrodes called petrodes that can record many neurons from the hippocampus. And you have these linear probes that give you a very detailed uh, idea of the local thing potentials in the different layers of the hippocampus. Okay, so what we've done with that is then to look at place cells and to look at rhythms in the hippocampus. So first the theta rhythm, so this 8 hertz oscillation. And this is very important because phase precession, so theta is actually shaping the uh, all cores of the spikes of, uh, of place cells. So you see here you have a mouse and the mouse is running on the track and here there is the place field, so the place where a certain cell becomes active. And look at this cell is doing. So we, are, we superimpose the theta rhythm. So it started firing here. Let's say what we call the ascending phase of the, of the cycle. Then in the next cycle, it fires a little bit earlier in the cycle, and then earlier, and then earlier, and then earlier. Okay, So it is a phase. The phase goes back, or we say the phase has a precession movement. Some cells will do that, whereas other cell cells will tend to be locked to a certain phase. So, and it's always fire at the same phase. So this is a very different arrangement from the temporal point of view. I will explain why this is important in a little bit. Now, if you look at, say, so what is the pattern? So are cells uh, processing, are cells uh, locking? Well, it turns out there is a little bit of everything. Some cells are more processing, some cells are more locking. A cell, if it has multiple place fields, can also be precessing in one field and locking in another field. So it seems like it's not a property of the cells per se, but it's probably the constellation of inputs to the cells. So that particular combination that will make a cell precess or lock to data, okay? So circuitry is in, so the fine balance of how things happen to come to each cell seems also to be important. So how about now the gamma oscillation? Well, the gamma oscillation, as I said, fluctuate and sometimes slow gamma oscillates and sometimes medium gamma, uh, so some slow gamma prevails, sometimes medium gamma prevails. And so if you look at phase precession for phase processing cells, so you see that phase processing cells really only become phase processing when medium gamma prevails on slow gamma. Remember that means that, so the input from entorhinal cortex is likely to be dominant at responsive time. So when, so here, so you see this pattern. So this is place on the x-axis, this is theta phase. And you see that there is here, so this uh, line, here, so there is a the, there is a correlation between the two, and that is the, a negative correlation, and that is the size of uh, phase precession. However, this is lost when you look at a phase locking cell; they don't have it at any point, and it's lost when you look at uh, periods with a stronger slow gamma. So, why is phase precession important at all? Is it just a curiosity or is it, well, it actually 
it has important tasks. And one important task that's been given, so this is a seminal paper from Bill Skaggs and Bruce McNaughton from 1996, it was to shape temporal sequences at a very, very fast scale. So within each data cycle, which is about 100 milliseconds. And if you consider the effect of, uh, of, uh, of phase precession and you combine multiple cells, uh, the idea what you get is that then you get little sequences within each data cycle, ABC, ABC, PCD, BCD, CD, blah, 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 that recapitulate on a compressed time scale what happens on a much longer time scale because now for the rat to transient or the mouse to tra transit through this uh, track, it may take maybe one or two seconds. So this scale is interesting and is useful probably because that is also the scale that synaptic plasticity processes can pick up and then essentially cause some learning. So this has been the textbook notion for more than 20 years. However, this is only true if you are in a completely noise-free case. So we went in and we looked at also to look, we looked at for data sequences and we looked at when they happen with respect to slow and medium gamma. And surprise, to surprise, they actually tend to happen more for the slow gamma, which is when you don't have the phase precession. So what we think we are showing is that these two processes are not one causing the other, but they are almost uh, addiction, but they are largely independent. Okay. So, and that tells us that there are two different network states for uh, temporal coding in the hippocampus. One when slow gamma dominates and one when medium gamma dominates. I'm going to try to unpack this slide a little bit. So this is a classic, uh, is a classic uh, display in this field where you have is the position of the mouse on the x-axis and the theta phase on the y-axis and each dot is a spike. And as you see, there is this negative correlation that corresponds to phase precession. So at the beginning of the field, the, uh, this cell is firing at the late phase in theta, and then gradually it fires at the earlier and closely. In many cells, you see that this correlation is given by two bubbles or spikes. So here we indicated in blue and in red. And likely the blue bubble is uh, related to CA3 input. And uh, this bubble here is related to the cortical input. So again, so this retrieving memory. So this CA3 is doing two types of work. So first, is retrieving memory and, and second is trying to anticipate where you're going to be next. For example, here you are of these teammates, you are here, and the, the hippocampus is trying to predict whether the mouse will go to the left or to the right. Okay. During slow gamma, so the Entorhinal input, so the cortical input is suppressed. So you only have the sequences that are generated in CA3, and you only have memory retrieval. When the new input comes from the entorhinal cortex, that has the effect of actually disrupting this neat sequential order. You see here. So you get this nice C, D, E, F. Then the, the, the mouse is here. So suppose the mouse is in D. It's also simulating this other path, C, D, G, H, 
and then again see the EF. So it's uh, it's doing it's doing what are called virtual trials and errors, and this becomes disrupted during the periods in which medium gamma dominates. So you have essentially a state for the hippocampus to absorb new inputs, and you have a state for the hippocampus to independently process uh, and uh, it's the information it has already stored and make predictions about the future. In conclusion, so spontaneous dynamic rules, I would say, uh, and the fluctuations in spontaneous dynamics influence the current computational mode. So, uh, and fluctuation take place both at the mesoscopic level, first part of the talk during sleep, microscopic level. So it's the level of single cells. So the connection between the two studies is the slow gamma. So I said slow gamma is related to the retrieval of information from this memory module called CA3. And what the first study suggests is that the activity from the cortex may bias what the hippocampus will retrieve. So which memory item will be retrieved. So as uh, my colleague Anton Sirota says, so the cortex is a student and the student is asking questions to the teacher that is the answer. And we need more work to, uh, to uh, uh, connect these two levels. So let me skip this. So acknowledgement to Rafael and Matteo, to Federico Stella, who is the main computational person uh, behind uh, this whole uh, work. And uh, so this is our group. And uh, so thanks a lot for your attention. And uh, yeah, uh, I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you for such an interesting lecture. And now we have, have some minutes for questions from our audience. So once again, we invite you to ask questions which Professor Battaglia can answer. And the first question from the audience is, have you investigated which environmental factors would influence the gamma oscillation most? And are similar effects observed in the human brain? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so these are very interesting uh, questions, of course. So uh, I, I have not, so there are studies in the literatures that show that when you have, uh, when they, so in our experiment, the mouse was just running back and forth. So now without any specific task, so you have the mouse that is running on the, on the track, eating a little bit, going to the other side, eating a little bit, and so on. So if you ask the mouse to, for example, remember something, so like, should I go left or should I go right? Then you see compared to the medium gamma. So because it's not, I wouldn't say it's an environmental factor, but it's a question of cognitive uh, uh, demands. Whether it happens in, uh, in humans, the answer is yes. So the evidence is a little bit more limited. So here to see gamma in the hippocampus, you need to have an Typically only happens when you have a patients that are implanted, for example, because they are epileptic. So they need to uh, receive an implant to find out where the epilepsy comes from in the brain. So there are gamma oscillations, there are sharp wave ripples. This has been uh, shown quite recently. However, so the distinction between slow and fire and medium gamma hasn't been explored as much as in, uh, in rodents, but I the inclined to say that 
it's likely that something similar will happen there. Okay, thank you for your answer. And we have some more questions for you. And the second one is, are animals bilateral or have you seen some preferences to one side? Okay, um, so there is a tradition in the hippocampal field to always imply to the implant to the right side. So the conventional wisdom is that the, the brain of the rodents is not lateralized. However, there are some recent data suggesting that in fact, the left hippocampus may be even the right hippocampus, which is interesting because it's, it's the other way around compared to humans where the right hemisphere is more spatial and the left hemisphere is more linguistic. Or if this answers the question. Yeah, thank you. So the next one is, do you think if the landscape changes, it would change the memory formation? Yes, and there are a lot of uh, experiments uh, on that. So for example, in some of my past work, so we use a very bare track and we used a track where there were a lot of objects, a lot of cues, a lot of uh, stimuli. And you see that you get a much richer and more informative memory representation when there are, uh, there are, more, uh, there are more cues. Moreover, each cue may actually help driving the the memory representation, if you want, uh, they, they would all be, be important for that. So that is, so now we are talking about really 20 years of uh, literature on place uh, cells that, as you probably know, were also rewarded with uh, a Nobel Prize in 2014 to uh, O'Keefe, Moser, and Moser. So it's a lot of work. Okay, thank you. And the last question that now we have, but we can also wait for a couple of minutes if anything will appear. And the question is, can we predict, for example, what the mouse will do in a maze by reading its hippocampus state? Yes, we can. And uh, so that has been done, for example, by the group of uh, David uh, Foster, and so these sequences that I showed, you also see when the mouse is not moving and you see sequence of place cells. And in many cases, these sequences are actually anticipating where the mouse is going next. So this has been, uh, this has been done. And let's say in our case, we are uh, more interested in really understanding the mechanistic basis of these processes. Okay, so it seems to that we don't have any more questions. So that was the last one. That's good, so that's good. Once again, thank you so much for such an thank interesting you. lecture. It was a pleasure to hear you. And to our audience, we invite you to the second lecture at uh, 5 p.m. So thank you and goodbye.